everybody welcome to this lecture i would like to give you an insight into the plain polar coordinate system having studied the uh, cartesian coordinate system for double integration evaluation we would now like to emphasize on the importance of the polar coordinate system Now first let us look at the straightforward cases where no polar coordinates will be required. Let us observe the following double integrals. The first problem, integral 0 to 2, integral 0 to 1, x plus y square dx dy. If you look at these limits, then they would suggest that the region is rectangle with x limits from 0 to 1, y limits from 0 to 2. So we don't need any polar transformation for this x, for this uh, problem. Now this is uh, another problem where we don't have to think of polar because if you look at the y limits, they are from 0 to 2x and x limits are from 0 to 1. If you trace, you will find that a triangle is formed and triangle definitely is not a polar curve. Then this is uh, another instance where we don't require any transformation to polar coordinates because the region will again represent a triangle. This is another typical problem, but still we don't need a polar transformation. All that you need is a changing change in the order of integration. So all such integrals that you can see on the screen can be evaluated directly or by reversing the order of integration, which means that you don't have to leave the Cartesian domain and think of polar. But not all problems will be of this type. Let us look at the context in which polar coordinates or polar variables will be required. Now look at this first question where we have x and y limits both from zero to infinity and the function is e power minus of x square plus y square. Now certain uh, integrals in advanced mathematics uh, arise of this type. This is another problem and then when you actually trace the region or when you try to identify the region you will find that it has got something to do with a circle. Then this is another example where uh, we have a region where a circle is involved. So such integrals are difficult to evaluate in the original xy coordinate system, but by changing the variables, we can achieve to integrate these functions. But which coordinates to select? Which variables should be selected? So let us look at the polar context. So one can think of polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates whenever the region of integration is bounded by polar curves. So we need, we need to understand clearly the difference between a Cartesian system of curves and a polar system of curves. So let us look at these illustrations. Now this uh, is the very famous three leaf rows and you can see that uh, it is an uh, unheard of case in the Cartesian system. Then of course the circle is there. The circle is a, a classic polar curve. And then we have what are known as cardioids, the very famous polar curve. Then we have got a limacon, which is very close to a cardioid. And then we have the Bernoulli's Lemniscade, scale, which is also another famous polar curve. So whenever you are trying to double integrate over such regions, I mean regions enclosed by polar curves, 
the transformation from Cartesian to polar becomes necessary. So if you would like to see the distinction between polar curves and Cartesian curves, Cartesian regions generally are bounded by straight line edges and other curves like parabolas and ellipses and so on and so forth. But when you have these types of curves as boundaries of the region, then transforming to polar coordinates would be the right choice. Now let us try to understand the polar reference frame. Now we have never seen such grids in the case of Cartesian regions, but you can see that we are not using rectangles anymore, but we are creating what is known as a polar grid by the use of radial lines. Radial lines are those lines originating from the origin and then by concentric circles. So when you use radial lines and concentric circles, you get what are known as polar rectangles. Not exactly rectangles, but uh, at a micro scale, they can be approximated by rectangles. So how do you transform from Cartesian to polar coordinates? This famous diagram was already explained earlier, where a point P with Cartesian coordinates X and Y is being transformed into polar variables R and theta using simple trigonometry. So we get the transformation equations x is equal to r cos theta and y is equal to r sin theta. r is the length of the radius vector joining origin to the point P. x is a projection of the vector on the x-axis and y is a projection on the y-axis. So simple trigonometry gives the transformation equations as x is equal to r cos theta and y is equal to r sin theta. And the idea of Jacobian is known to all of you. The Jacobian in this case happens to be r. Now, one of the challenges when you perform polar double integrals is fixing theta limits and r limits. In order to make things very simple, I have selected eight diagrams involving a circle so that you will be able to understand theta limits by looking at the spread of the circle or a part of it. Now, when you have a circle centered at the origin and extending over all the four quadrants, you can imagine the radius vector starting from the x-axis and making a 360 degree revolution to generate the region. So the theta limits will be 0 to 2 pi. Now when you take an upper semicircle, it goes without saying that the radius vector has revolved through an angle 180 degrees. So the theta limits will be 0 to pi. Now this is what we call the right semicircle, where still the center of the circle is the origin. And because this region is touching both the negative y-axis as well as positive y-axis, and because orientations are always anti-clockwise, the theta limits will be minus pi by to pi by And this of course is the quadrant of a circle. In the first quadrant, the theta limit will be 0 to pi by 2 because the radius vector has moved from x-axis to y-axis, sweeping an angle of 90 degrees. So these are the four cases where the center of the circle is at the origin. Now this is a typical case. We've got a circle centered on the x-axis, but passing through the origin. And this circle is touching both the negative y-axis and the positive y-axis. Therefore, the theta limits will be minus pi by 2 pi by 2. This is half of the circle on the left, semicircle, uh, which is leaning on the x axis and touching the positive y axis. Therefore, the theta limits will be 0 to pi by 2. Now, this is a semi, this is a circle whose center is on the y axis and it is spread over the first and second quadrants, therefore the theta limits will be 0 to pi. Then this is half of the circle on the left, and because it's completely occupying uh, the first quadrant only, therefore the theta limits will be 0 to pi. So these are the eight classic 
circle diagrams by which we can understand how to fix the targets. You can use this as a justification to fix the limits for theta in all other polar curves. Now comes a challenge. How do you fix R limits? Now suppose we consider this semicircle. You know this semicircle has got centered the origin, bounded the x-axis below, and bounded by the semicircular arc, in this case x square plus y square is equal to 4. Now let us talk about fixing the theta limits. Take the x-axis whose equation is y is equal to 0. You know y is now r sin theta in the polar variables. r sin theta is equal to 0 has two solutions. r is equal to 0 or theta is equal to 0. Because when sin theta is 0, theta is 0. But because the focus is on the r limits, I have just highlighted r is equal to 0. Then how did we get that r is equal to 2? Take x square plus y square is equal to 4. You know x square plus y square is equal to r square. When r square is 4, r is equal to 2. Therefore, this region will have r limits from 0 to 2. And let us also see the theta limits. The theta limits will be 0 to pi, as already explained earlier. And now r limits are from 0 to 2. So whenever you have a circle or a part of a circle which centered the origin, R limits will be constants. That is what we will have to observe. Let us look at a typical case. Suppose we have a region outside the semicircle x square minus 6x plus y square is equal to 0, and inside the quadrant of the circle x square plus y square is equal to 36. If you look at x square minus 6x plus y square is equal to 0, it will have center at 3, comma 0 with radius 3 units. Whereas the circle x square plus y square is equal to 36 has got centered the origin and radius 6 units. So you can now try to understand. First, let us concentrate on x square minus 6x plus y square is equal to 0. As already explained, this semicircle has got centered at the point 3, comma 0. And because the radius is 3, it has to pass to the origin. Now let us look at the circle x square plus y square is equal to 36. And we are considering only the first quadrant of it. So that big circle x square plus y square is equal to 36 will have centered the origin at radius 6 units. So the radius of the smaller circle is 3 units. So the length of its diameter is 6. And now we have got the quadrant of the circle, a big one, whose radius is 6. So you shade the region between, I mean, above the uh, semicircle, that means outside the semicircle, but within the quadrant. Now if you observe this shaded region, it has got three boundaries. Let us start with the y-axis as a boundary. Y-axis is x is equal to 0. Transform to polar coordinates, you get r cos theta is equal to 0. This has two solutions, r is equal to 0 or theta is equal to pi by 2. Because cos theta will be 0 when theta is pi by 2. But because the focus is on finding the r limits, let us highlight r is equal to 0. Let us now come to the semicircular r, x square minus 6x plus y square is equal to 0. Remember, x square plus y square is r square and x is r cos theta, therefore the equation will be reduced to r square minus 6 r cos theta is equal to 0. It will have two solutions, r is equal to 0 or r is equal to 6 cos theta. So let us underline r is equal to 0 and r is equal to 6 cos theta. Finally, we have one more boundary, that is x square plus y square is equal to 36, which can be written as r square is equal to 36. And when you take the square root, you get r is equal to 6. So if you carefully observe the various solutions for r, we have r is equal to 0 appearing twice, r is equal to 6 cos theta, and r is equal to 6. But mind you, we just want two limits for r, not three. Let us see how we can select two limits from r is equal to 0 
r is equal to 6 cos theta and r is equal to 6. There is no doubt the theta limits for this region is 0 to pi by 2 because the region is found entirely in the first quadrant, starting from the x axis and ending with the y axis. But let us see why r limits have been selected as 0 to 6 cos theta. Now, why did we not consider r is equal to 6? r is equal to 6 is obviously there in 6 cos theta when you put theta is equal to 0. So when theta is 0, cos 0 is 1, therefore you will get r is equal to 6 in any case. So it is not necessary to consider r is equal to 6. In fact, it will be wrong to write the limits for r as 0 to 6. 6 cos theta will definitely give rise to r is equal to 6 or theta is equal to 0. So this is generally one area where a lot of confusion will be there. But in the course of my problem solving, I will once again touch upon this problem to remove any minor doubts. Now what is the procedure to convert from Cartesian to polar? The first step you must observe is from the given region description or its limits, trace the boundaries and shade the region. So you must be extremely good in uh, drawing uh, the curves given their equations and the equations will be available through the limits. So you need a lot of uh, hand holding here which I am going to do during problem solving. So the first point is trace the boundaries and shade the region. Fix the limits for theta which was already explained through eight circle diagrams. Determine the R limits from the bounding curves but make sure you have just a pair of R limits. Evaluate in the polar domain. So with this, I think you must have formed a formative idea about how to transform from Cartesian to polar. And please remember the Jacobian comes into play, uh, which was already explained in an earlier lecture. However, during problem solving, I will once again touch upon that. So what, what do we do from here? With the experience of the last two lectures, you know when Cartesian double integrals can be evaluated, including changing the order of integration. And now that we have got a little bit of insight into polar coordinates, what do we do? We need some illustrative examples so that any uh, iota of doubt that you have about when to apply polar coordinates, etc., can be removed. So basically, students should understand when not to transform to polar and when a transformation is required. And please remember, converting to polar by itself is not the ultimate solution. You must know that even polar coordinate system comes with limitations. I have already told you that certain Cartesian curves um, need not, uh, I mean certain Cartesian double integrals uh, do not qualify to be converted to polar, but certain things will have to be converted to polar. But beyond polar, is there something else? Yes, that was also explained through one of my earlier lectures where we think of a totally new coordinate system where the Jacobian again comes into play. And this is what I was trying to tell you. You must look beyond polar uh, coordinate system, looking to transform and evaluate double integrals in other domains also. So whether you do in polar or other domains, please don't forget that you need transformation equations and you also need the Jacobian. And then finally, why do we do all this business unless we apply this knowledge to a context, unless we know where to apply double integrals, there is no purpose of studying all this highly technical uh, stuff. So therefore, we are going to apply very soon um, double integrals of all kinds, Cartesian, Polar and other types of double integrals to some practical problems. Thank you. Thank you.